सर वी आर लाइव नाउ विथ ऑल योर परमिशन आई एम स्टार्टिंग दिस सेशन फॉर टूडे ओके गुड इवनिंग एवरी वन प्रेजेंट हेयर आई एम फराज फ्रॉम आई जी सी पी वेलकम ऑल दी पार्टिसिपेंट ऑन टूडेज वेबिनार लेट्स वेलकम टू डे स्पीकर विद ग्रेट ऑनर नन अदर देन प्रोफेसर डॉक्टर निशांत कुमार सर एंड लेट मी शेयर सम ऑफ द अचीवमेंट ऑफ सर सर हैज डन एम बी बी एस डी ए डी एन बी एम एन एम एस एंड प्रोफेसर डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ एनेस्थेसियोलॉजी एट लेडी हार्डिंग मेडिकल कॉलेज एंड एसोसिएटेड हॉस्पिटल एंड टूडे सर इज गोइंग टू स्पीक ऑन अ टॉपिक रिड्यूज क्रिटिकल वेस्ट इन आवर प्रैक्टिस ओ टी एंड आई सी यू टू नो अबाउट मोर इन डिटेल्स अबाउट दिस टॉपिक आई वुड लाइक टू इन्वाइट सर and hand over this session to sir over to you sir kindly proceed from here uh, good evening everyone so today's topic is reducing pharmaceutical waste with high environmental impact in our practice that is in ods and icus so i am dr nishant that sir has has already said now uh, when we talk of pharmaceutical waste we have to first realize that actually we do have a problem and we have to identify the problem and realize it what is the impact of uh, the pharmaceutical waste that we create why drastic uh, measures are required for uh, this problem and if at all measures are to be taken what are the measures that can be taken what is the solution to this problem and that is what we are going to discuss under these three topics uh, basically today so first we should know what the problem is there is an old saying that if you are not part of the solution you are part of the problem but to be a part of the solution you have to know what the problem is right so we have to identify and realize yes there is a problem and we are very much a part of it so we have to see what the problem is so what is pharmaceutical waste pharmaceutical waste simply put is drugs in medicines which are no longer required or no longer can be administered to the patients so these can be expired drugs drugs which are unused drugs which have spilled you have lost drugs which have been withdrawn recalled damaged or contaminated by any of the substances or in another words drugs which is just lying there cannot be used in a patient is a pharmaceutical waste but remember it is not only the drugs in medicines but also the packaging that they come in so normally injections would come in bottles and vials capsules tablets should come in boxes even bottles and vials should come in boxes gloves masks tubings so any uh, ancillary uh, equipment which is required to administer drugs also comes under the category of pharmaceutical waste so syringes tubings iv sets um uh, the saline bottles so everything is a pharmaceutical waste now why does the pharmaceutical waste arise from the administration point of view incorrect inventory management leading to expiry of the drugs not being used lengthy procurement cycles so that means that you stock up a lot of drugs and they are not used and then they end up getting expired poor storage drugs are destroyed no longer being used improper monitoring of drug drug expiration times that means that you feel that the drug has a longer time to go but then when you take them out of the store they have already expired one common instance of drugs of our uh, pharmaceutical waste is that whenever the new lot comes you push the older lot behind so whenever we are taking the drugs from the store it is the newer lot which is being used while the older drug is being pushed behind and behind and remaining hidden ultimately it expires distribution problems so there might be distribution problems from the source irrational usage of drugs that is where the role of the clinician comes in that we draw in too much and ultimately we end up throwing in the bin or the uh, uh, sink improper disposal uh, disposal of residual drugs how do we dispose of drugs propofol we just flush it down the sink antibiotics other drugs even uh, drugs which we are not using saline we just flush it uh, in the uh, waste basket So is that proper uh, disposal of uh, residual drugs? I think so. No. And then another thing is the waste water or the waste which is flowing from the OT. How does it get uh, segregated from the other household waste or the uh, uh, hospital waste? If there is no separate mechanism of treatment of effluents from the hospital 
and it just goes with the household waste into the same sewage treatment plant and ultimately the water ends up coming to our houses for drinking right so you can imagine that we know that delhi is a huge uh, there are mountains of drum dumps in uh, delhi and uh, all the major metro cities and their spontaneous combustions and fires which do occur in this waste dumps remember that 3% of this waste has been generated by healthcare services this is apart from the industrial and the pharmaceutical companies based 3% of the total waste mountains that you see in and around your city has been generated by the hospital or the healthcare services that we are very much a part of so that is the waste that we generate now coming to our practice what are the agents that we can think of that we generate waste inhalation agents we are all aware of the global warming potential it's a hot topic now we all know that inhalation agents do cause uh, we just make them breathe in the air without pre treatment and we know that it is contributing to global warming nitrous oxide and uh, other uh, inhalation agents propofol we take it lightly but propofol is a major contaminant of soil and water antibiotics that we use day in day out nsaids yes nsaids have known to cause renal damage soda lime we just discard it off in the bin plastic that we use day in and day out for administering these drugs glass so even glass is not uh, i mean it is recyclable but if we just throw it off it is a waste and it does contribute to the pollution latex the gloves that we use right even if it's latex free it is still rubber it still causes pollution and the general waste that we produce the cardboard boxes wrappers and other things right so these are all the waste that is generated in the ot so why should you bother about this waste why why does why 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 this uh, talk why why this realization and what is the impact of uh, this waste that creates on the environment so it has a three fold impact it is not only the ozone depletion and greenhouse effects with the inhalation agent that we worry about and we are banning nitrous we are banning desflurane it is a soil pollution also remember it is the vegetables that we eat the animals that we eat the animals are also uh, taking their nutrition from soil and water the same soil and water that we are using so the antibiotics glass soda lime propofol they are they all contaminate the soil and then they affect the plant yield and also contaminate the plants and the fruits and the seeds that we eat as we'll see in the subsequent slides water the major source of water pollution is propofol nsaids glass and plastic which disrupts marine life and soda lime which increases the salinity of the water so again by contaminating water we are reducing our yield we are increasing the salinity of the soil and because of the improper uh, disposal of uh, these medicines we are increasing pollution of the soil and causing uh, problems with the food that we are eating so coming to the inhalation agent that is the most hot topic and we know that when we talk of global warming potential when we talk of co2 it is taken as the gold standard or a global warming potential of 1 over a period of 100 years now if you see here nitrous oxide is 265 times more has a more uh, greenhouse warming potential than co2 the maximum is a desflurane and the least is so co2 so if you are using co fluorine you can say okay fine i'm fine i'm using co fluorine and air i'm not causing that much of a greenhouse uh, effect but then the global warming potential with respect to co2 is still 130 times over a period of 100 years that is a time when you won't be alive and it is your children who will have to uh, suffer the increased temperature so as we all know desflurane contrib contributes up to 80% of greenhouse gas effects nowadays Sevoflurane has been more or less static. Halothane and isoflurane has decreased. Why? Because we are now not using halothane and isoflurane. The most of the inhalation agents, uh, majority being used, is sevoflurane and desflurane. Now, nitrous oxide contributes to around one to three percent of the total uh, greenhouse effect that we see in the world today. Now, 
we cannot say how much is our contribution because uh, nitrous oxide is also produced by fertilizers, farming, agriculture, then um, industries. But we can say, safely say that anesthesia can produce up to 0 0.1 to 0.2% of global warming uh, by use of nitrous oxide. Just by anesthesia alone, that is the bare minimum estimate and it is equivalent to the pollution caused by 1 million US cars. So it is not a short, uh, it is not a small thing to say, okay, just using nitrous oxide, it has its benefits. But then over the period of one year, it is equivalent to 1 million US cars that we are contributing by using nitrous oxide in our practice. So, uh, let's compare it to the cars. Okay, we know that uh, when we drive a car, because uh, the CO2 is released and because the uh, greenhouse effect, uh, there is global warming potential. Now, this is in one mark hours. So, if we are using, most of us have now gone, gone on to uh, low flows, but still, uh, the conservative estimate is we don't go below 2 liters per minute. So, if we use two liters per minute of flow and one mac car. So sevo fluorine is like driving eight cars, eight miles. Isofluorine is 15 miles. Desfluorine is 378 miles. And nitrous oxide at 0.6 mac hours, that is the concentration that we use, is 112 miles. So even if we are using desfluorine and uh, uh, nitrous oxide, so it will be 112 plus half of this. So this will be roughly 200. So around 312 uh, miles, uh, it will be equivalent to driving uh, 312 miles. So this will be more in kilometers. So that you can see. Okay. So it is saying, as you say, in combination, 0 0.6 mac hour of nitrous would be added 2.4 mac hour of a volatile. So that is what we say that this fluorine causes the maximum by sevofluorine causes the least, but nit nitrous oxide, even at 0.6 mac hours, that 60% nitrous oxide that we use causes a lot of greenhouse gas effect. Now, there was this recent article. Uh, now, this is by the uh, environmental scientists and not by anesthesiologists or clinicians or uh, medical personnel personnel, they, they have said that global warming potential that we have just discussed is an oversimplification. There is uh, radiative forcing, which should be taken into account when we consider the uh, uh, breakdown of and the greenhouse potential of these uh, gases. So desfluorine, probably it's too early to say, maybe we have been a bit hasty in banning it. It may not be as bad. The carbon dioxide emissions from plastics because of the manufacturing and the disposal of plastics is substantial. So again, TVA regional, when we talk of this, has to be taken into account. But they do agree that nitrous oxide, the use of nitrous oxide, has to be minimized. And it is one of the major pollutants and the major environmental hazard in anesthesia practice that we have right now. Right? So it is not only the inhalational agents that we uh, have a problem with. So if we see the cradle to gate greenhouse gas emissions, that means right from the manufacturing till the disposal, scolin, sugamadex, propofol, the least. But then when we go on to midazolam, phenylephrine, rocuronium, ketamine, remifentanil, fentanyl, hydromorphone, morphine, and dexmedetomidine. So this is the greenhouse gas emissions. Can you see this? So dexmedetomidine has got perhaps the highest uh, greenhouse gas emission. So it is not only the inhalational, it is the IV agents also which causes, uh, which causes the greenhouse gas effect. So our aim should be to choose the anesthetic which causes the maximum benefit to the patient with the least environmental. So that should be our goal. Now, this was uh, again a recent uh, study by Royal College of Anesthesiologists where they compared sevofluorine uh, anesthesia, TIVA, I'm sorry, sevofluorine, uh, TIVA, and regional anesthesia, and they found that the carbon dioxide emissions were the least with regional as expected, 
moderate with Tima and the maximum then Timofluorin uh, based and now they have taken into account everything here, including the electricity and the plastic that is required for Tiva and regional. So this shows that inhalational, we are taxing our resources, we are causing more pollution, and we are harming our environment more as compared to when we are using Tiva or regional techniques. So that is one thing that you have, you have to keep in mind. Now, how does pharmaceutical uh, contamination occur? So the pharmaceuticals, either they are used in the hospital and domestic or drugs for the animals. Ultimately, either they go to the soil for landfill, ultimately they leak into the groundwater, or they are simply disposed of into the sewers, possible leakages, wastewater treatment plant, and then surface water, which again is distributed for our human use. So this is how pharmaceuticals enter the water. Similarly, when pharmaceutical salmon manufactured from the veterinary medicine, the animals also consume uh, these in the manure, soil, surface water, and from the surface water also expired and, and unused landfill disposal, they go to the soil, groundwater, drinking water. Now, we'll come to how this impacts us, the water and soil pollution. So propofol, NSAIDs, erythromycin, um, hormones, metformin, plastic, and propranolol all have been found in soil because of improper drainage, soil and water. So what are the effects of these uh, drugs in the I mean, found in soil and water? Now, we know that aquatic and land life is definitely uh, affected by this. The animals consume these drugs. The plants uh, absorb these drugs. And ultimately, we are the ones who are eating these plants and animals. So this is an indirect source of drug which is going into our system. Mutations in the plant and animals, endocrinological effects. Now it has been seen that in certain areas where the disposal people living around the uh, hospital facilities and all, and they are using groundwater, there have been instances where the behavioral problems and endocrinological effects are much more potent because of the improper disposal of uh, the drugs. Antibiotic resistance, it is not only the uh, antimicrobial uh, stewardship that has to be practiced. The food that we are eating, the animals that we are eating, they are getting uh, micro dosages of antibiotics that we were disposed of uh, improperly. So ultimately, it is unknowingly we are consuming antibiotics and we are getting resistant to it. The toxicity, then neurobehavioral changes which are occurring. We all know, we all say that uh, today's generation is a bit high and there are uh, neurological and uh, this thing, and we blame it all on the social media and the screen time, but it could be because of the drugs. So this is how these drugs, this pollution is affecting us all. Remember, if you're fond of seafood and uh, other, um, I, if you're a non-vegetarian, remember uh, propofol has been found in seawater, freshwater, rivers, ponds, everywhere. It is very difficult to destroy propofol. So, the fish that you're eating or shrimp that you're eating might be containing propofol and it's uh, phenol and diglycerol in everything. So remember, next time you're eating your seafood, you are enjoying your propofol as well, along with the seafood. Or as I like to say, propofol uh, flavored seafood. So what is the solution? First, the answers lie in the problem itself and we have to keep it simple. Now there are six R's which we have to use when we think of the solution. Rethink, refuse, reduce, reuse, recycle, and research. We'll take them one by one. So rethinking is we take a, we make a policy. United States, Canada, and Europe, they have a very well set policy how the expired and unused drugs are to be disposed of, right? So there are set rules, they may not be robust, but still they have started, uh, they have uh, uh, taken an initiative to frame these rules regarding disposal of drugs, which I think every country or every region in the world should have. Now, similarly, the practice of disposal. Now, if you see, majority is sink landfill, this is Southeast Asia, our region. Now, return to pharmacy is 86% and 84% in India which is very good and much better than the other countries. But then still, once it is returned to the pharmacy, 
how is the drug disposed of? Ultimately, go to landfill without treatment. So landfill is not the solution. Pouring it out into the sewers, into the sewage is not the problem, is uh, not the solution. We have to pre-treat it or once we have disposed of, we have to treat it before discharging it to a larger body. So that is what we have to think of. Now, policy, right? So the policy has to be at various levels, manufacturers, health authorities, we have to create awareness and we have to um, incite uh, enforcement with the rules. Manufacturers have to extend expiration dates, adjust packaging size, uh, sizes, Distributors and pharmacies, they have to optimize their stock management. Uh, efficient prescription and uh, dispensing should be there. Patients have to be conscious. And again, they should not just throw off the medications in the dump and uh, normal ways. Prescribers, we have to prescribe judiciously. Injudicious prescription or for longer periods is ultimately going to harm the environment. So refuse. This is where the clinician comes in. We have to think of agents which will, which have an environmental impact and not use them. So avoid desflurane and nitrous. We can consider T wine tree. Destroy waste and acidic gas. But how? We'll come to that a bit later. So we have to destroy, not only just uh, release them in the air. Clinical indication. So can I use another technique instead of this particular technique? Or is it imperative for me to use this technique only? This we have to think. Any cases which can be done in regional, why give general analysis? Anything which can be done under TIVA, why use inhalation, a high impact anesthesia uh, agent? Then it is not only the uh, larger picture, but look at the shorter picture also. Occupational risk that an anesthesiologist is facing. We are not using AGSS most of the times. So inhaled anesthetic, we are the ones who are inhaling it inside the OT, right? Uh, the ventilation systems are not there. We just, we, we proudly say that we can administer anesthesia anywhere. So is it correct for the patient? Is it correct for the surgeon? Is it correct for you? That is the awareness that we have to create. That is what we have to think of. It is not only the global, the short term thing is also affecting us. Reduce. Remember, nitrous oxide, the majority losses of nitrous oxide is because of the leakages. Improper storage of cylinders, leakages in the pipeline. So that is where we uh, we cause, uh, we lose nitrous oxide and release it into the atmosphere. Again, a simple measure like reducing low, low uh, by reducing fresh gas flow. As I showed it to you, by reducing the fresh gas flows to 0.5, we can uh, reduce the greenhouse gas effect uh, considerably. Then using AGSS. Now the AGSS is simply that you're reducing the OT pollution, but then the environmental pollution remains the same because all the AGSS is doing is taking out the gases from the OT and releasing into the um, atmosphere outside the OR. So you have to pre-treat rather than simply use AGSS, obviously, uh, rely more on TY regional techniques. Propofol is the most commonly wasted drug. 45 to 67 percent of propofol is wasted. It lands up in water. So use appropriate dosing vials, drop only as much as needed, and you keep ampules and vials ready on the trolley rather than keeping uh, the propofol loading up. Remember, water has to be treated up to 1000 degrees centigrade to neutralize propofol, a virtual impossibility. Unless until you heat up propofol to 1000 degrees centigrade for two minutes, propofol is not going to get this. So that is the temperature, that is the uh, heat, that the energy that you require to neutralize propofol. Plastic and latex, avoid unnecessary use. Going for reusable uh, drapes and uh, other things instead of disposables. And always consider the life cycle assessment of the uh, ancillary equipment that you're using, how many times you can use. There are materials now which are coming up, which you can reuse, and you can prolong the life without causing any significant damage or harm to the patient. So this is how we can reduce the pharmaceutical uh, waste. And if at all the waste is created, 
we can reduce further pollution by uh, returning the do returning to donor and then they, this is where the policy comes into the play where uh, the policy has to be there how the initial or the donor is going to dispose of these uh, this waste landfill an easy way to do so but then again uh, you have to neutralize it first before you send the waste to landfill incineration as i said up to 1000 degrees centigrade may be required for propofol encapsulation now this is an um, interesting technique in which uh, the drug or the waste is poured in a steel drum and uh, you seal it so much more like a time capsule and you just leave it there and dump it so it will take ages but then it is still not decayed it is still there and whenever it is open it will cause pollution inertialization so you just block it in concrete cement and lime again whenever the cement breaks the pollutants will be released into the atmosphere sewer so this is one of the most primitive ways and this is what we are doing and causing pollution burning in open containers yes but then with the toxic fumes and the waste the unburnt waste which is much more polluting chemical uh, decomposition this is now attractive and actually all waste should be chemically decomposed before uh, going for any of these above methods so that it becomes in but then this is a costly affair and uh, this is what we have to think so reuse whatever can be reused instead of disposables the drapes the sets the bully pots and all now the thing is you okay laryngoscopes also use it once throw it up in india we are not doing so but yes uh, because of the infection blood pressure cuffs how will it make a difference is we have to probes you can clean them right so the focus has to be on reusables but then not always now if you see this study the co2 emissions were almost the same in australia uh with the single use and uh, reusables why because they use a thermal energy source so the energy production for requiring to run autoclaves the water requirement to pump water it all consumes electricity now us and uk they use mainly renewable sources of energy so the reusables are uh, consume uh, uh, produce less co2 but in australia we and, and like in india where we are using uh, the still the fossil fuels for energy production it is the co2 em emissions are going to be same whether we use reusable or uh, disposable right. also the thing is that uh, uh, also the thing is that uh, remember when we talk of uh, single use equipment where is it being manufactured not in first world it is being manufactured in the third world what about the pollution here there we are reducing pollution in the first world but we are increasing the pollution in the third world where is all the disposed uh, waste coming off uh, for disposal the third uh, the third world so it is not that okay the us says okay fine my uh, carbon footprint is uh, low and it is zero or negative but then you have passed on your burden to the third world ultimately what is happening for the earth it is the same right so this is what we have to think and that is where the policy thinkers have to uh, really contribute so recycle is simply conversion of a product so it's basic materials and then turning them into product steel and glass can commonly be recycled and it is essential to recycle plastics but it is very difficult <coughs> because conversion from plastic to its uh, basic structure causes air pollutants and release of chlorine however near critical methanol at 250 degrees centigrade is effective so these are the newer methods uh, we can recapture the uh, and acidic agent in zeolite activated charcoal it, but the problem with activated charcoal is it just adsorbs and the moment we take it out again poof the uh, inhaled and acidic are released into the atmosphere without being inactivated so metallic organic frameworks are being developed along with zeolite which will um, decompose or uh, make the inhalation agents inert before they can be released into the atmosphere then we have the supercritical co2 again this is a facility technique 
and nitrous oxide again it's very difficult to neutralize and heated catalysts are required so it's a costly thing so research now i'll just run through these because uh, these are more for biotechnologists and the policy makers rather than for us clinicians but we should know about this so we have the anaerobic bio, uh, biotechnology treatment where the waste uh, wastewater with pharmaceutical components is uh, treated first by hydrolysis, acidogenesis, and acidogenesis before it is released into streams and uh, waters. Photocatalysis, where the photocells are required, the pharmaceutical wastes are inactivated before again releasing the uh, wastewater. Then we have the chemical decomposition using electrodes. Again, we make the, chem uh, the chemicals present in the water. Uh, we uh, make them inert before releasing. Making the uh, wastewater pass through membrane bioreactors. So that means that the sludge that is there is the contaminants, it can be removed, and this can be treated separately by clean water without pharmaceutical contaminants can be um, circulated. Use of microalgae for degradation of uh, ultraviolet rays and uh, microalgae which can uh, inactivate the antibiotics and other drugs. So this has been used in sewage treatment plants. Antibiotic resistant genes in the plants. So this is how we can reduce the soil pollution. So these are the plants which have uh, antibiotic resistant genes. They uh, take up the antibiotic from the soil, um, absorb it and then uh, remove it, inactivate it and ultimately the water which is there and the soil which is there is, is spread off your uh, pharmaceutical waste. Now, this is the ideal pyramid. First is we increase the wellness. We reduce the burden of the disease so that people don't come to doctors. Uh, so they don't need treatment. They are not dispensed with drugs. So ultimately, the waste is reduced. Uh, we use judiciously all the drugs, lower doses as much as necessary. Uh, we don't give it for long duration. Give it only when necessary. Use then again uh, what to use as I said uh, when we talked of um, your appropriate use of uh, choice of uh, drugs that we use uh, disposal how we dispose it and then treatment before disposal and advanced treatment if at all it has been um, released into the seepage then the water before it is released for public consumption it has to be uh, treated again before it can be supplied to the uh, household, right? So this can only come with education of producers, medical service, consumers, and decisions. With that, uh, I would recommend that uh, you choose a modality with lowest in environmental impact, avoid dust flow rain, and minimize stress gas flows. Please, it is safe to use 0.5. Now, the latest FDA guidelines say that even with CO chlorine, you can go up to 0.5 liters per minute of uh, fresh gas flow. There is no harmful effect. So please go down with your flows. Better not to use nitrous oxide. And if at all you're using it, please make sure that there is no waste of nitrous oxide. And all you have to do is minimize the pharmaceutical wastage in whichever and whatever way you can. With that, I'd like to thank you and I'm going to questions. Thank you so much, sir, for taking out your valuable time and sharing your knowledge on this topic, sir. I definitely think this session knowledge is going to help all the participants during the practice also. Uh, sir, as I can see, sir, we have received some questions from the participants, sir. If you yeah, allow, uh, uh, can we okay. ask? So the Please. first question is, sir, uh, from uh, Dr. Niranjan. He's asking, like, you have explained the role of doctors and what will the role of patients play during the waste management in the hospital, sir? See, uh, in the hospital, the role of the patient is very limited. It is at, at the house and domiciliary treatment when, when we are prescribing tablets and most of us do that. Any expired drug, we just throw it in the dustbin with the household waste. So it mixes with the normal waste and goes to the normal uh, 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 household waste. So that is how we are contaminating. But in the hospital, it is not for the patient, but for us to see it is for the healthcare personnel to see that whatever drugs that the, that those have not been consumed uh, are to be uh, disposed of properly. They, you should avoid spillages. You, you should avoid wastage of drugs. 
So the role of patient is very limited inside the hospital. Okay, thank you so much sir, for answering, sir. Another question is from Dr. Subraman Nyam. He is asking, how can technology and digital solution be leveraged to streamline medication management process and minimize waste in OT and ICU? See, the thing is, technology, as I said, you have to make a policy, then you should have proper accounting and uh, uh, management of the drugs which are there, as I said. The drugs, normally what happens is the newer drugs are being used, the older ones are being pushed uh to the back so if we keep a proper inventory and management the wastage can be reduced and uh the first part of the question was sorry ai technology and what was the what was the other part can you repeat it was that? Uh, like digital technology like how digital what can be the digital and, and technology latest technology yeah the other technology is uh, like in the treatment as i uh told you photocatalysis then we have the enzymatic degradation, electrical de degradation, uh, bioengineering where we are uh, causing these uh, genes implanted in the plants where the soil pollution can be reduced. So all these things can actually reduce pollution. Then newer substances where we can uh, inactivate the inhalation agents, uh, decrease or inactivate uh, nitrous oxide. So this is how technology can actually help and this, this is in the realm of uh, biotechnology rather than clinicians and they have to work on this. Okay, sir. Thank you so much, sir. As I can see, sir, there is no more question from the participant. I hope you have done justice to this topic, sir. And sir, like uh, we, as we don't have any question with all your permission, shall we conclude this session for today? Yeah. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Welcome, sir. And hope to see you again with different topic in future also, sir. Till then, take care.